Good morning. I would like to welcome you to the regular public meeting of the Henry County Board of Commissioners for 9 a.m. Tuesday, January 5th, 2010. would like to wish you all a very happy new year. At this time, I will call the meeting to order and ask for an acceptance of the agenda. I have a motion by Mr. Basler. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I thought maybe you weren't in favor of the agenda. Uh, motion carries 4-0. The first item on the agenda is the appointment of the vice chairman for 2010. And at this time, I will entertain a nomination for that position. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, the fifth district commissioner, Johnny Basler. Okay, we have we have a nomination for Mr. Basler by Mr. Bowman and a second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries four zero one. <laughs> he's very he's very humble. He didn't want to vote for himself. All right, and we also want to thank Mr. Bowman for his service um, as vice chairman for I believe about fourteen about fourteen months. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We definitely appreciate that. I know it's a difficult job and a thankless job at times, but we appreciate your service in that position. The first item on the agenda is going to be a planning and, under planning and zoning services, and that's a discussion regarding a partnership with the Board of Education and Local Arts Coalition to display artwork in county buildings. Our presenters, Mr. Michael Harris, Planning and Zoning Services Division Director, and Jason Morrison, Communications Department, and that's exhibit number one in your book. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Good morning Chairman. Good morning, Board Members. This morning, Jason Morrison from Communications and I are here to discuss, again, for discussion only, not asking for any, any recommendation at this time, but um, a few, some months back, the conversation came up concerning the hallways here within the administration building and what could be done to perhaps, we had a number of pictures that were up that were somewhat dated, and the decision was made to take those down, paint the walls, and since that time, some conversations have gone on concerning what could be done to replace those, if anything. Um, at that time, I mean, conversations with the county manager, the then county manager, came with a couple of different ideas, one of which was to display children's artwork within our halls. Um, Jason and I have met with some of the local art teachers, um, Ms. Kirby Mang in particular with, at Hickory, Hickory, Hickory Flats Elementary School, who serves as one of the um, regional liaisons within the art, local art school art community. And they've done this, and I'm sure you've seen this in other locations. Uh, they currently display children's art, students' art at the, our own Board of Education, as well as in areas such as Hartsfield, Jackson International Airport, as well as a number of other um, airports throughout the, throughout the country. As, um, so we've, since that time, we've spoken with, as we've spoken with Ms. Mang, some other members of the art community, and our initiative to this morning is kind of twofold. One is a collaboration with the Board of Education, which would involve working with the um, art teachers to display the students' art here within the county admin building. And the second one, something that Jason's been working closely on, is um, doing a display with some of our local professional artists within the county building and as well as uh, some, some of the other admin buildings as well as some other county facilities. Um, just a couple of quick points I wanted to touch on concerning the initiative with these children's artwork, we have, um, in speaking with the art with the art teachers, we would work. The county staff would work in conjunction with the art teachers to to go through and screen and and determine what what art pieces would be selected. Um, our thought initially would be to display art twice a year for about five to six months. Um, also, um, that would also expand throughout the summer months as well. Um, so therefore, the pieces would be changed out every you know, two times a year. Um, our initial request, um, just looking at it um, from the start, was 60 pieces, and that would be comprised of 20 at the elementary level, 20 at the middle school level, and 20 at the high school level. And that can certainly be changed and modified as time goes on. Um, in doing some rough estimates, we've spoken with the frame company that supplied the frames for the pieces of work that are on display at the Board of Education. And a rough estimate based on the 60 pieces, and it'd be at three different sizes, three different size pieces, and I'll go through that in a moment, um, would be roughly about $1,200, we, we feel, um, based on the, those initial estimates. 
<clears throat> as far as labor is concerned, spoken with Mike Hebel with our building facilities, we anticipate the initial labor would be roughly about six man hours to install the frames initially, after which um, twice a year we have to just go back through and change the pictures out, which we anticipate no more than about two, three hours, two, three man hours to, to take care of that. Um, one of the questions that we, we brought up with the, with the art teachers was in regards to liability, if they're damaged, if anything should happen to the um, artwork. What we, what we would require is a release form to be signed, and here's a copy of one here. And this is actually on the back of, you can see the release form would be signed by both the student or the parent of the student, and it, it would hold harmless the county for any damage or any loss or anything that could happen to the piece of work that, that, would, that would occur. This particular one, those would be displayed on the back of the art pieces. This particular piece, and I'll flip it over real quick. You can pan out a little bit. This was actually on, this is actually one of the pieces of work that was on display at Hartsfield Jackson, and she was able to let us use this as one of the, um, as one of the examples for today, so. Uh, we've, I've had some, some preliminary conversations with some members of the Chamber of Commerce. Our thought would be to work with the chamber, some other local groups, to actually see if we can solicit donations for um, the cost of the frames. And that, that, again, that's one of our initial, initial thoughts. That's one of the things we want to bring for discussion this morning. Um, we think it would be a, a, you know, a great boost both to the county as well as the Board of Education, this collaborative partnership between the two. It gives us an opportunity to highlight you know, some of the works of our local students. So we're excited about the prospect and again, just want to bring it up for discussion. The other part of this is, I'll let Jason speak on it, is in regards to um, displaying some of the pieces for our, some of our local, pro local professional artists. I want to speak on that. And uh, this, this piece is probably a little bit, um, occupies a little bit less real estate. And right now, just kind of starting off here in the, in the front lobby. And really all it is is um, just a rotating exhibit, if you will, like maybe every two months, something like that, to have a local artist come in. We, you know, we probably have to go through some paperwork, have similar liability forms, some kind of uh, sign up sheet for those that are wanting to come in and make sure that the art is obviously appropriate to be displayed in you know public facility that kind of thing <clears throat> um, but just I would work with uh, the local artists on that list and coordinate getting them in um, <clears throat> great thing about in terms of cost is that these artists would already be required to have the artwork framed and ready to display so really in terms of cost for that it would just be finding a place to display it and having the artist willing to come in and change their work out so in terms of um, supervision that kind of thing man hours we wouldn't really be um, spending six hours to hang the art or just get the uh, artist to come in and swap their work out stopped by the Board of Education the other day and just took a quick picture of one of their hallways there and you can kind of get an idea of um, the effect it has within a, within a hallway as opposed to being just a bare, bare walls. The piece on the right is actually a piece of, 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 of artwork that also is on display, but you know, principally we'd be looking at the framed art, and as you can see, there's a couple of different sizes that are on display there, and that's what we'd be looking for as well. Um, what we're asking for this morning is really just three things. One, if it's the board's desire, authorization to proceed with this initiative and working with the art teachers and securing the art pieces, and moving forward, um, and secondly, um, working with the chamber and other local businesses to to, to work on solicit, soliciting donations to cover the cost for the frames themselves, and then third, uh, you know, our thought would be to come up with a plan um, to address exactly how we would structure and and how we would how and where we would um, showcase the professional artists. So that's our request this morning. You know, want to open up for discussion? See if you had any questions about it or any concerns or or if you want us to go ahead and continue to proceed. I, I think the uh, addition of the children's artwork <clears throat> to the, the hallway areas would certainly brighten that area up and, uh, and encourage the kids to, to, to get involved more in the arts and um, if, if they know that there, there's a possibility that their artwork can be on public display. So um, I, I really think that's a great idea and I'm sure you'll not have any problems at all finding contributions in the community to sponsor the purchase of those frames. Um, does any board member have a question or comment about the proposal? I'd just like to say I, I want to see it move forward uh, because I think that any time 
a, a young artist can get more display time or area, the better that they will they will encourage them to continue in that field. And, and no, I'm proud to see it. I'm glad to be able to offer this. And you, it seems that you've covered the liability issue. Uh, and obviously someone is going to screen the art to be sure because all art can't be displayed That's right. in a public building, obviously. So uh, it appears that things are in order. So I, I think we need to move forward. When do you um, expect to be able to have the artwork up on the walls? I I think probably by March 1st, I think we certainly can. Um, in speaking with the, the local art teachers, so that they can compile the art pretty quickly. So a big step would be just going through and getting the funds. I, I agree. I think we get a lot of support from our local business community to come up with the, um, the solicit the funds to cover the cost for the frames. He said the framing portion won't take a couple of weeks. So anticipate by 1st of March. And if the board's desire, we can come back before the board just once we nail down the final prices. And I guess we have to anyhow for acceptance of the donations. So we'd likely come back before the board one more time before we actually work on displaying and give you an actual date as far as when we'd be able to put them up and place them in the hallways. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much for thank the you. time and effort you've put into this. We appreciate it. One item I want to mention before we move on under planning and zoning services is the uh, t under technology services the request approval of a resolution regarding a fiber optic broadband network. This item has been postponed to a future meeting and will be re-advertised at that time. The reason it has been postponed is Commissioner Jeffries is out of town today and we wanted to assure that all commissioners were present when we heard this particular item. So if you're here in reference to that, that will be re-advertised for a future meeting date. The next item under Planning and Zoning Services is an update regarding the ARC Community Choices 2009 Comprehensive Plan, ULDC, and CTP audit. Our presenter is Stacy Jordan, Planner 2, Exhibit Number 2 in your book. Good morning, Stacy. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Commissioners. It, on March the 5th of 2009, Henry County applied to be included in the ARC's Community Choices Program. And this is a, a program that's competitive, and we were we were chosen to be a part of this program. Our request was for the ARC to read our ULDC and our comprehensive plan and our comprehensive transportation plan and make sure that they, they supported each other. And the Atlanta Regional Commission has done that and they have issued a report that's dated November of 2009. And today we have Stephen Cosby from the Atlanta Regional Commission who will go through the ARC's findings, and they had six recommendations, and answer any questions that you may have. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Stephen Cosby. Good morning, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. I'm pleased to be with you this morning. Um, as Stacy said, um, you all were selected as um, one of nine cities and counties throughout the region to receive what we call implementation assistant assistance grants um, through the ARC's Community Choices Program. To give you a little bit of background on uh, the quality growth audit process, what we do is we take all of the documents that are related to the planning process in your, count in your county and we check them for internal consistency. And so what we use as a measure of, of consistency is pulling out, literally pulling out the goals and strategies and objectives from those plans. And so we are taking um, the goals and strategies from the plans that you've already adopted um, to make sure that they all line up. So it's not measured against some outside criteria of smart growth or quality growth or whatever. It's just checking to make sure that the plans that you've already adopted um, line up with one another and that they don't conflict, that basically you can implement the goals of, in, in the plans that you've already adopted. And so, um, as Stacy did mention, we did um, read the Unified Development Code the comprehensive plan as well as the comprehensive transportation plan. And you'll see um, in this document that uh, we have several recommendations and uh, we found a, a high level of coordination um, which is always great to find. And we just found a few minor things um, that the county may want to consider 
moving forward. And these are both basically ways to coordinate growth and development in some of the mixed use and activity center areas. Um, and we do mention in, this, uh, in that recommendation that the current LCI study that's going on in the county um, will be helpful to inform some of those recommendations and how the county may choose to move forward within those activity center areas. We think that that will, is, is actually the, the best possible scenario um, since that is a, a community-wide process involving stakeholders across several sectors. Um, we also provide the county with um, examples of uh, tools to protect r rural agricultural land and plan for future green space as well. Um, what we try to do is provide um, our cities and counties with sample language that they can literally take out of our document and put into their code and adopt if they choose to um, so that they may better implement their goals or provide sample documents of um, ordinances or other policies from throughout the region or the country depending on what uh, the issue may be. And so we've done that with several uh, appendix materials toward the back of the report, as you'll see as well. I um, also want to draw your attention to Appendix A, um, starting on page 10 of the report. And this is just a, a, a brief uh, sample matrix of what we went through in terms of looking at the different issues and all the documents involved and potential, potential conflicts and, and resolutions to those conflicts. So that's kind of the basic document that we use to, to track uh, the review and the progress as well as the final recommendations. Um, we have re uh, reported back to the Zoning Advisory Board um, last November um, with these recommendations, and um, it is up to that body in, in terms of uh, how to move forward with implementation. And um, we just wanted to come back to, to you all as the, um, elect, the body of elected officials that submitted the application to, to inform you of the progress and that the, um, that the actual project is completed now, and I'll be glad to um, entertain any questions that you may have. Does any board member have a question or comment about this item? I guess not. You did a great job. I just want to add that you know, it's our intention as a staff, we're still reviewing ARC's recommendations as well. So the staff will be going back to the making our full review of their recommendations, and we'll subsequently be coming back to the board for our review, for our recommendations as far as what we feel is appropriate to, um, to, to modify within ULDC. So at this mm -hmm. time, we want to make sure you receive all of ARC's recommendations. We'll internally be reviewing those as a staff and come back to the board for, to make recommendations on what we feel is appropriate to implement. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. We certainly appreciated receiving this um, service from the Atlanta Regional Commission and I know it's been very helpful to our staff as well. Sometimes when you look at documents over and over and over again, you, you don't pick up on some things that perhaps you should. So we certainly appreciate the time and effort that the Atlanta Regional Commission has put into helping us with this. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item is a public hearing regarding an amendment to the Henry County Unified Land Development Code. Our presenter is Jeremy Gilbert. Planner from Planning and Zoning Exhibit Number 3 in your book. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. <clears throat> the item that is before you this morning is an amendment to Chapter 10 of the Unified Land Development Code in regards to the service deliver delivery strategy that was adopted by the Board of Commissioners on December 15, 2009. The adoption of the service delivery strategy included that all planning and zoning functions and responsibilities for the City of Hampton shall now be that of the Henry County Planning and Zoning Department. Section 10.0100 shall be amended to reflect the membership, quorum, rules of operating procedures, and then the following sections were amended, and there's eight sections of the Unified Land Development Code that are affected. And the sections that are affected state that a member from the City of Hampton would be appointed in the same manner as the member from the City of Stockbridge be by vote of the City Council. Um, their term of office would be the same term of office as the remaining members of our board put in a section for the removal and the reappointment of that member for the City of Hampton. Also changed the quorum now that there's eight members to a quorum of five. And also added a statement in the rules and operating procedures that the Zoning Advisory Board shall follow any bylaws and rules for transaction of business adopted by the Board of Commissioners. 
and also under the rules and operating procedures, outline some procedures specific to the chairman now that there's an eight member um, zoning advisory board that the chairman shall have no voting privileges except as provided in D and E. D being in the event that the zoning matter lies within the chairman's appointed district, the chairman shall vote and the vice chairman will serve as chairman for that zoning action. The vice chair shall have no voting privilege on said zoning action and then E, the chairman shall only vote in the event of a tie. Um, and I will an entertain any questions that you may have. Any questions or comments pertaining to this item? Just a comment, Madam Chair, and, and of course this is an amendment to the code, and uh, I've made comment about it before about amendments. This is a necessary amendment to, to the code because Hampton wanted to rejoin Henry County for their uh, planning zoning services. So I, I think this is quite a difference if someone's looking at, well, you amended this plan. This is because of, of a need not to amend the substance or the, the material in, inside that plan. So I just wanted to point that out. It's quite a difference. Correct. Because this is an amendment, does this require public comment? Um, this, this is, was it yes, yes. yes. Okay. At this time, I'd like to call for anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this amendment. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none, is there any further questions or comments from the board? If not, you have a resolution before you, and I will entertain a motion. We have a motion to approve by Mr. Stamey. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Moving on to social services, request authorization to purchase security cameras for transit buses. Our presenter is Mr. David Williamson, Transit Director, Exhibit Number 4. Good morning. Good morning. Back on April 20th of 2009, the Board of Commissioners approved a project list and a grant to accept $427,674 of uh, federal stimulus money from the Federal Transit Administration. All these projects are 100% reimbursable. And there's, so there's no uh, local match required. <clears throat> One of the projects that was identified uh, in that grant was to purchase security cameras to place on the buses uh, that we use every day. We have a high percentage of our uh, riders are members of the disabled and senior community. The cameras will really help improve driver and uh, safety, uh, driver and passenger safety, and uh, can also be used for driver development. Um, the cameras will be trained to view some critical safety areas on the buses, such as the wheelchair lifts and the passenger doors where, where people enter the buses each day. We uh, interviewed three national companies, and they demonstrated their prod, uh, product for us. Uh, one company, Sayon, actually uh, placed a demo camera system on the bus, and we've had it now up and operating almost four months uh, using that. The um, the process that we would like to use instead of going out to RFP would be to, to purchase off of an existing contract, a General Services Administration contract. Uh, the Federal Transit Administration has approved uh, the county piggybacking on that contract. Uh, Sayon is the only, uh, only company that we interviewed that is uh, a member, a participating contractor member of the GSA process. So we would like to purchase from uh, piggyback on that contract and purchase the cameras purchase the Sayon cameras from that uh, contract. The cost will be $999.40, and that includes shipping and installation. Um, as a follow-up, we also talked with four other companies that uh, have used Sayon. They all report a positive experience uh, with the equipment and in dealing with the customer service reps of the company. So we're requesting board approval to move forward with the purchase this morning. Are there any questions or comments from board members on this item? Sure I have one. Mr. Stamey? Dave, do we have anybody that's going to be monitoring these cameras on a regular basis? We will not physically be able to watch them every day. We have about 17 buses every day, so that would be physically impossible. We will be able to go back. There's what's called an alert button on the bus. Say if an event happens on the bus and the driver would like to make sure that that is reviewed, they can hit the button and that tags or flags that particular precise moment. We can go back and look at that uh, when it occurs. We can also, you know, if a customer calls in, a passenger calls in and says, you know, they've got a concern, we can go back and review that tape then. We will also be able to use it periodically, yes, or we can go back and, and review and use it for driver development, but on a daily basis, uh, we would have to have several more staff members 
to monitor you know every type as as the buses are going down the road. Any other questions or comments? I think, Madam Chair, Mr. Basler, David, when you when you said that, are, are, are we anticipating on hiring more staff at one at no, a certain time? No, sir. Not not at this point. I do not have that recommendation or idea in my head. Uh, I think we'll be so able this, to. This thing has tapes running. So if there's an incident, we can go back and review yes, the tape. Correct. There's no matching funds. No. Okay. One hundred percent reimbursable. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, you have a resolution before you approving the purchase of the cameras from Sayon in the amount of ninety nine thousand four hundred ninety nine dollars and forty cents, and I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve, Madam Chair. Motion to approve by Mr. Holder. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to public works, request award of a bid for installation and or repair of guardrails. Our presenter is Mr. Terry McMickle, Public Works Division Director, Exhibit Number 5. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Board Members. <clears throat> this morning we're bringing before you a, a bid amount or a bid to repair some guardrails at four locations. Fortunately, the guardrails performed what they were supposed to do, but in so doing, they were damaged and need to be repaired. Um, these bids were sent out through the purchasing department to nine local vendors. We had four responses. We are recommending an award to the low bidder of Quantum Mac International in the amount of $18,624. Do you have any questions or comments pertaining to this item? All right, if not, you have a resolution before you awarding the bid to install and repair guardrails, and I will entertain a motion. Move to motion by Mr. Bowman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Basler. All in favor? Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Thank you, Board. Okay, again, um, technology services has been postponed to a future meeting, so we're moving on to financial services. And this is a public hearing, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners for declaration of official intent to finance the Community Conference Center located at 280 Most Brown Drive. Our presenter is Mr. Mike Bush, Finance Director, and that's handout number one. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board. Um, we're coming here today to have a, a public hearing because we are going to use a lease purchase type reimbursement arrangement to purchase this facility. Back in November, we entered into an agreement with the City of Locust Grove to purchase this facility, and it will be purchased on February the 22nd, um, you know, due to bank uh, month ends and things like that. That's why we had to go out to, to February to do this. And we are coming here today to say that we're going to go out for you to provide us the ability to go out and find a financing mechanism that will work the best for Henry County. And then once we find that, we will come back to you for adoption of the, that agreement um, around the 22nd of February. Are there any questions or comments pertaining to this item? All right, if not, I believe that this is a public hearing, and at this time, if there's anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in opposition to this, I would ask you to step forward at this time. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor? Okay, let the re record reflect that no one is speaking in, on this item, and if there are no questions from the board, Mr. Bowman? Is this I'd ask uh, Commissioner Holder, this this is a SPLOS 3 project, is it not? It was designated as a SPLOS 3 project. And, of course, with the downturn and with the opportunity arising to get this facility, and I thought it had been discussed in, even in the open meetings that uh, when Hampton has an opportunity to build theirs because there was a senior center for Hampton and for Locust Grove, that if this one, since it was available, is funded in this manner, if the if the funds come in, which they should, to build one, but the fight was going to be who was going to get the one, the first one, then those funds that were designated for District 3 for Senior Center would go to Hampton to build the Hampton Senior Center. Is that not correct, Mike? Is the, the Both of the centers will be purchased uh, using these economic development bonds that Mr. Jim Monticell brought to us. 
and then if the SPLOS budget of $180 million is, if it, we receive more than that, then we can fund these um, lease purchase agreements through the SPLOS process. That's what our ultimate goal is, to use the SPLOS funds, but they're not available. That's why we're going ahead and using this mechanism, which allows us to stretch it out over time to build these facilities now instead of waiting for future years. Understood. I, this, this is um, SPLOS <coughs> three list. So, am, am I understanding that this will not be funded through SPLOS? Because if it's not funded through SPLOS, I might have a problem with it because it's on the list. So, I understand that they're on the list. We can't change the list. Correct. But I'm not really interested in personally spending a lot of money that's not on the list only to turn around and use the list to do another one. And, and so the both of them on the list, Mr. Bill. I understand they're both on the list. Both but I mean if this one is not going to be funded through SPLOS 3, then I personally have a problem with it. Okay. My, uh, my understanding was in SPLOS 3. I, I don't know. This is I'm it is, kind of it is SPLOS 3 project. But we're going out, we're not. Oh, we're not using SPLOS 3 revenue to pay it. Correct. At this point, we're not. That is correct. Is that, at the end of the day, is SPLOS 3 going to pay for this facility? That is the intent, but we can't say today. I'll say this. We, you know, we originally had a $240 million estimated SPLOS budget. We reduced that down to $180 million because of the downturn in the economy. When we reduced from 240 to 180, we had to take items that were on the capital projects list, just as you did on your roads. You know, you, you reduced your roads by $5 million. We, re, we postponed the construction of several items, some fire stations, the two senior centers, and the, I think the recreation center and District 2 were going to be postponed, at which time we found a mechanism, a tool, to allow us to build these facilities today and use the SPLOS proceeds if they come in over the $180 million to pay these down. Otherwise, they would be paid down through a lease purchase agreement, which would be funded through the capital projects and general fund, but over a longer period of time so that it does not affect the operations of the county. And, like I say, if we come up with $185 million in SPLOS revenues, that $5 million would go to pay off these economic bonds immediately. That is, that, is the, that is what Jim Monticell, that the bond council brought to us when we were in I think our first or second um, workshop in conference room B. That's, we had talked about doing the two senior centers, the recreation center, potentially a fire station to go ahead and build these because these are on the SPLOS list and everything that we're looking at using these economic development bonds for are SPLOS related projects. The interest rate is reduced by 45 percent. We, we have the ability to what we pay in in interest, we will either get a credit or 45 percent of our interest payments back. So, in other words, the net is we only have to pay. It is a, it's not a tax exempt bond. It is a taxable bond. But when you take the taxable bond and you're only paying 45 per, or 55 percent of the, the, uh, the interest, is actually beats a tax exempt bond in the market. In actuality. Because I, I mean, I have no problem with this facility because I think it's I think it's a good facility, and I think that uh, having looked at it on a number of occasions and making it a community conference center and a senior citizen center, I don't have any problems with that. I have a problem with the fact that if we don't get enough, we'll move forward, and then all of this comes out of the general fund, and we're having to pay on this bond, and and. Quite frankly, a 45 percent reduction in the interest on the bond is not as that doesn't really uh, have as bit large of an effect. Now, it seems like to me that we would be you know, uh, more in that this should come splash three, and it and if we don't have enough to do the one in Hampton, then we have to put it off for a while until we do have enough. But uh, I I can't support it coming. If, if it's going to not be a SPLOS project and be financed through SPLOS, then, then I, I can't support this. 
Let me make a suggestion because I think this is going to be something that we need to get some more information on. If we could table this item to a future meeting for two weeks, and if you could um, sit down with each commissioner and go over the numbers, I'd li I personally would like to see the cost savings that we've recognized on other capital buildings that are coming out of SPLOS 3 and the collections to date to sort of see where we're at. Um, because I know that we've, we've gotten some really, really great prices on some of the things that we've been doing, and that might help, help us have a little better understanding of where we're at in our SPLOS collections and make a more informed decision. I don't know what the time frame is for this. Is there, is there going to be an issue with postponing this a couple of weeks? We would just have to re-advertise for a public hearing. And um, I'm not sure if that's going to affect your ability to no. sort of market it, it won't. The, the placement. And you all know we've already, I mean, we're going to, per we've already entered into the contract to purchase this facility. So uh, and, the issue of finance. So if we use SPLOS 3 funds, I have no issue with that at all. And, and the chair is 100% correct. We're um, over a million dollar savings on the, on the parking garage alone. We're uh, uh, several hundred uh, or a hundred thousand or, or something a million. Uh, almost a million on the Hampton library I mean there are savings out there that should allow us to go and I mean I'm not I'm not I don't want to I don't want to put it off I just want to be sure I mean I, I just want to be sure that the financing that we're going to put in place is in fact coming from SPLOS 3 and not something that will come out of the general fund down the road Payment of these bonds was still, we could use SPLOS funds to pay down the debt on these funds. This is part of the economic stimulus package uh, in which Henry County was awarded uh, $9, million, $9 million for the uh, facility bonds. That is correct. And we will lose that money if it's not expended by the end of the year. That is um, correct. So SPLOS funds will be used to pay down the debt or can be used to pay down the debt. It's just that we... Um, thought that it would be a good opportunity to take advantage of this, these um, very good deals on interest um, to get these capital projects moving forward. And it allowed those capital projects to be done sooner rather than later because the money is here and available now as opposed to waiting until SPLOS revenues come in. So. Just to hold it. I believe that interest rate is 2.9 with the 45% reduction. Is that not correct, Mike? At, at the time when we first originally looked at it, it would be two. It was 2.9, which would have been the full rate minus the 45%. That, and I think it was 2.9 compared to 3.9, 3.8, something like that. That's, that's interest on the stimulus funds. Is that not correct? When you do, and when you're getting back to each of us as commissioners to give us a recap of the cost savings from projects. I would also like included in that where monies have been transferred to and from projects within the SPLOS 3 program so that we get a true accounting of the, the cost savings, but also where the money has gone and where it has, did it stay in the area where the cost savings occurred. Okay. Okay. All right, if, it's, if it's the pleasure of the board, I'll entertain a motion to table this item. I have a question Mr. For Mike, isn't the financing on that facility assumable right now? Sir, in the financing that Locust Grove has right now, isn't it assumable? But couldn't we use that same plus three revenue to continue paying down the debt until there's enough there to pay it off? That would be the, the whole idea would be to we do have savings in SPLOS. So as we start this process, we, we finance the building and the debt, the interest and the principal payments of this building would come out of the savings from SPLOS. But there's not enough savings from SPLOS right now today to fund the full $2.8 million facility. That's why we would say we would start today out of SPLOS funds, and then if it got to the point to where the general fund had to catch it up, we would catch it up until the SPLOS revenue came back in or until the next particular, the next SPLOS program came in and could, you know, to pay down this debt and pay back the general fund because this is an intent to finance. It would, it would really not be a cost to the general fund unless you chose to leave it a cost to the general fund. It's just a mechanism to get, it's just to get it done today instead of waiting, you know, an additional six years possibly. That's, that's kind of what the concept was, but you can't really go out there and say we're going to fund it out of SPLOS when there's not enough savings and, and dollars out in the SPLOS uh, 
arena left that's not already earmarked, budgeted for parks and, and libraries and uh, one fire station, uh, things like that. And I definitely can, can have a meeting with each of you and, and bring you up to speed to where we're at, and then it might make you more aware of, um, you know, more able to make a decision on this issue. I have no problem with that. Any other questions or comments? I'd just like to reiterate, be sure and, and do give us a tracking of those funds. We will do so from when it was originally 240 and how we've got to where it's at today. And, and I, I've been corrected. I made a comment about District 3 funds. It's actually District 2. I said Hampton, but I believe I said District 3. So most people know that I wouldn't be sending money to 3. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Holden, would you like to make a motion to table this item? Uh, if I must, yes. Okay. I move. I, I will move to table. All right, we have a motion to table by Mr. Holder. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Basler. All in favor? Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, Madam Chair. Mike, this would, will not, if this gets worked out, will not affect the closing date on this facility. Will yes, sir. We'll have plenty of time to go ahead and do That's why we came to you as early as we did. So we did have time to go out and search for a, a funding mechanism, and two weeks will not delay that at all. And we have several minutes that need to be approved. Um, October the 8th with the Board of Education, November 16th, 17th, and 30th, which are all regular meetings, and December 2nd and 9th called meetings. Are there any corrections or additions to be made to the minutes? Uh, Madam Chair, do we have another item by any chance? We have county manager comments okay. after this all and right. uh, county attorney comments. Okay. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? <laughs> manager comments is that involved the issue that we have with the bonding issue with Gary Bowman with the uh, mm -hmm. we were supposed to hear that this morning and it's not in here. No, we don't. you are going to comment on that okay all right any corrections or additions to the minutes if not I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes Most approved. I have a motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? The motion carries 4 0. This time we're moving on to county manager comments, and I believe the first item of discussion will be request to amend Article 1 of Chapter 3 13 4 of the County Code entitled Parks Prohibitive Acts, and that's Exhibit Number 7. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commission. This really is what I would term a housekeeping matter, cleaning up a conflict with a uh, uh, OCGA statute. Uh, this was pointed out to us through a BOC uh, website comment by an observant citizen, and uh, Ms. Wiley has addressed it very well. Uh, basically, we had an ordinance uh, which was in conflict with the state law, which allows us to regulate the discharge of weapons in parks, but not the possession. I think you'll agree that uh, regulating the discharge is a little more important than regulating the possession. Ms. Wiley's uh, change in the ordinance uh, basically gets us in line with the state statute. Uh, it takes out our uh, regulation of possession. It maintains the regulation of discharge in county parks, and I would ask for your approval of this, uh, this change. Any questions or comments pertaining to this item? All right, if not, since this is a proposed amendment, Ms. Wiley, do we need to call for public comment? No, ma'am. Okay. I'll entertain a motion on this item. Move to approve. Have a motion to approve by Mr. Stamey. Is there a second? Second, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Amen. And I'd just like to point out, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Public Defender Bowman for the work he's done on an item that will garner us uh, uh, quite significant savings uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in several of the courts in the county. Uh, I'd just like to tell uh, uh, Gary that uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Wiley are, uh, Mr. Bush and Ms. Wiley are reviewing those documents and they're coming up with the final uh, documents which will allow us to, to maximize our savings and they'll have that ready. They're gonna, they need to meet with you and they have, they'll have that ready for our next meeting. And that will be on our next agenda. Is that all? all right. That's all I have. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay. 
All right, moving on to our county attorney comments, we have requests for approval of a resolution designating prosecuting attorneys to assist in prosecuting county ordinance violations, exhibit number eight. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Um, twice each month, the county attorney's office prosecutes county ordinance violation cases. Those are misdemeanor cases, and they range from public um, disorderly conduct cases for pu public drunk, public fighting, um, all the way to animal control cases, dog bites, unrestrained animals, um, junk vehicles being stored on property, illegal dumping, um, trash being accumulated in um, folks' yards. And sadly, with the downturn in the economy, my office has seen a substantial increase in the number of cases that are flowing through magistrate court, such that there is a need to um, get additional attorneys to assist in the prosecution of those cases. Um, the judges in the magistrate court are even discussing adding a third day to handle the influx of these cases. And before you is a resolution um, designating two additional attorneys to assist in me in those efforts. Um, Ms. Bettis is a former uh, solicitor with our solicitor's office, so she is amply aware of these uh, cases. In fact, if, an, if a citizen or an individual wants to have a jury trial for county ordinance violations, those automatically go up to the solicitor's office to handle because the magistrate court does not do jury trial cases for these type matters. So those two attorneys have been shadowing me for the past couple of months, and I feel very comfortable that they are, they will represent the county well, and the law requires you to specifically allow those persons and name those persons to um, prosecute. So this is the resolution I have for you today for your approval. Are there any questions or comments pertaining to this item? Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Wiley, as far as the two attorneys that were named, was there a process in selecting these or uh, in, in, in the why? Because I know that we probably will get Ask the question: Why did you choose those two? Or why did you choose those that person? That's a good question, Commissioner Holder. Um, initially, um, I reached out to uh, Chuck Spahos to see if he had uh, attorneys on his staff who could handle these, since they handled the jury trial um, prosecution cases. So, you know, I wanted someone who was familiar with our county ordinances. Um, you know, he has a heavy caseload for his office as well. So he recommended Ms. Howard. Ms. Howard actually prosecutes city of McDonough violation um, cases. Uh, she's amply familiar with the courts and having had experience in our solicitor's office, I thought that it was um, befitting to have her. I did talk to some additional attorneys, but she was best fitted, best suited to handle these cases. She's familiar with the judges, the courts, our ordinances, and it just made good business sense. Chuck, Chuck Spayhouse is the solicitor. Yes. Okay, that's that's my question. Any other questions or comments? If not, you have a resolution before you designating prosecuting attorneys to assist our county attorney in the prosecution of county ordinance violations, and I will entertain a motion. Move to approve. Have a motion to approve by Mr. Holder. Is there a second? Second, second by Mr. Staney. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Thank, Thank you. you. At this time, we're moving into our portion of public comment. Citizens are allowed to voice county-related concerns, opinions, et cetera, that are not listed on the agenda during this portion of the meeting. And we had several who have signed up. And as I call you forward, each person uh, could please state your name and address for the record, and you'll be given five minutes. And the first person that has signed up for public comment is Mr. Steve Cash, who is Executive Director for the Henry Council for Quality Growth. And his topics are going to be the 2010 Census, Property Tax Return, State of the County Address next Wednesday uh, the 13th. And Steve, you have five minutes, but I don't know how you're going to say all that in five minutes. But good morning. 15 minutes. Did we change that this year, <laughs> oh, Madam Chair? Madam Chair, and uh, I want to wish you all a, a Happy New Year and uh, District uh, district com commissioners wish you happy new year also and I want to say welcome to our new uh, county manager uh, well I understand you came from Dalton and I understand you had some challenges up there because of uh, economics and uh, we have some challenges down here because we've been known because of the housing boom in Henry County 
And as a result, there's been many, many jobs lost. So you've got some challenges ahead of you, and I think you've got a lot of experience that you're going to help us with, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, again, I want to thank you, and I support wholeheartedly anything we can do to clean up the county. If we need to add two, three, or four more prosecutors on that. I know that's not in my verbiage there, but I'm... Okay, that's, that's for free. Now my time starts, right? Okay, good. Um, the um, Last year, there were two different but similar transportation funding bills in our state legislature that failed to progress to viable options. The Henry Council for Quality Growth, by the way, my name is Steve Cash. I am the uh, Executive Director for the Henry Council for Quality Growth, a lifelong citizen, 2000 Flat Rock Road, Stobbridge, Georgia. These, these two uh, pieces of legislation fail to see the light of day. Uh, we, the Council for Quality Growth, want to go on record that we do support do support some kind of legislation, a tease floss, a 1% sales tax, whether it be statewide, uh, whether it be regionally or locally, uh, this legislative session. We think it would be most helpful. Uh, transportation matters are being handled uh, very quickly in our county right now as things catch up. And I want to commend you all and staff on the great job that you're doing building our roads and bridges. Thank you so much for that. That enhances the quality of life for Henry County. We need to get behind our legislators, and I'm talking to citizens and those that are, are viewing us on, on TV, and to, and to encourage them to vote one way or the other, hopefully yes, to get some kind of legislation through so we can have a referendum where voters in Henry County can vote our choice of what we want to do, the future in transportation in our county or in our region and in our state, number one. Uh, secondly, I want to take this time to encourage all affected Henry County property owners. How many of you own property in Henry County? Okay, most of us. To take a long, hard look at your 2009 property tax assessments soon Property owners will be receiving assessment notices from the county's tax assessor's office. And if they value, and if the value of your taxes have changed from last year, and you were like me, and most of our council members were, we either wanted to tear it up or return to sender address for unknown because the taxes were, were entirely too high. You have the opportunity to appeal those tax decisions made by our tax assessor's office, not affiliated with our Board of Commissioners. I want to make that point clear. You have the right to appeal that. And let me encourage all of you property owners in Henry County to exercise that right to appeal that because property uh, values have gone down, went down last year, and that's the year they'll be counting, 2009. Anywhere from 8% to 20% you'll find in Henry County, and sometimes a lot more than that. So take a long, hard look at your taxes. You have the right to appeal them. And look on, uh, on the county's website, and you'll see the appropriate information on how to appeal and the uh, timeline that you need to appeal. And finally, uh, let me encourage you also to attend, if you've not done so, uh, the State of the County Address next Wednesday. Uh, the Honorable B.J. Mathis will be presenting uh, that, that address, and uh, we're very anxious to see what's going to happen in the year 2010 through our Board of Commissioners, through our county, and also maybe some things that happened last year that a lot of us don't know about. Uh, looking forward to that, uh, Madam Chairman. And uh, remember to get your RSVPs in quickly. Uh, because the room is filling fast at last. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank you for serving the citizens for Henry County. I appreciate you very much. And thank you. You've got seven thank seconds. Thank you. Left. You did good. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. I want to follow up on the State of the County Address comment that Steve made that um, if you are unable to attend the Council for Quality Growth Luncheon for that, the speech will be pre-recorded and it will air simultaneously the same time that it's being presented there so all of our citizens will have access to that information at the same time. That's the format we used last year and we'll do that again this year. The, the citizens are coming out to do those. 
make sure everybody feels out their senses. Thank you, Steve. Everybody. The next citizen that has signed up for public comment is Mr. Robert Hen, and he will be speaking on Campground Road Extension. And um, Mr. Hen, if you would step forward at this time. And you have five minutes. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Robert Hen. I live at 1261 Winwood Drive, McDonough. Uh, this is a part of uh, Winslow at Eagles Landing uh, subdivision, a community with only one entrance and exit, composed of quiet, two-lane rural streets where young children can and do safely play and ride their tricycles and bicycles, where residents enjoy walking, both for health and recreation, and to get to the community pool and tennis courts. What it, being displayed on your overhead is a copy of your current plan for that portion of campground road extension going through our community. I have provided six copies of this to the clerk, which I believe were distributed to the uh, commissioners so that any who are not familiar with the plan uh, can have their own copy. I will email a copy of this speech to each commissioner so that uh, they can reference it and be able to help answer my question at the end of this. Your current plan is to drive a four-lane, 45-mile-per-hour arterial road carrying, by current estimates, somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 cars and trucks each and every day through the heart of our rural community. Next to our swimming pool, separating it from our tennis courts. My wife and I both are totally convinced that this plan will destroy the value of our home, not to mention the value of each of the other 308 homes in our community. What we want to know is how you can possibly think that driving a four-lane, 45-mile-per-hour arterial road carrying by current estimates somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 cars and trucks each and every day through the heart of our community will not devastate the values of our homes. This is not a rhetorical question. We want an answer. We want copies of the studies you have made, the calculations you have used, the reasoning you have followed, which would give us any assurance that what you are planning will not destroy the investments we made in our homes and devastate our lives. Thank you for the time. And uh, I want to return the Chair's uh, wish of a uh, Happy New Year to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Han. The next citizen that has signed up for public comment is Gwen, and I know I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Nishizaki? Yes. Wow, okay. And you, you're also going to be speaking on Campground Road Extension. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to address all of you. Um, Mr. Han has left the picture up there because I am also a resident of that community, and I, I'm going to see if I can use my finger and point here. We have the pool right there. I'm four houses down from the pool right here. Pretty much every day during the summer, my now five-year-old and I walk up to the pool. We walk because it's good exercise, and we have clean air to walk in. If we have a four-lane road, 45 miles an hour, 20,000 cars and trucks a day, it's not so attractive to walk to that pool. It's not so attractive to sit at that pool, breathing all of the fumes that are being output from those cars. At the uh, meeting, I believe it was December, but it may have been November, a timeline was presented to, to the group. Apparently, this road was proposed in 1996. And sometime between 1996 and now, some people that sat in those chairs before you thought that it would be okay to split a subdivision in half. 
I don't understand how that could be okay. The road was clearly on the books before the subdivision, but somebody before you thought it would be okay to put a subdivision there. And <laughs> um, I had written down, I think at one of the previous meetings, one of, one of my fellow residents got a little bit emotional. Clearly I am too, because this affects us financially, it affects us physically, it affects us at the very heart of where we live, and that is emotional. So I apologize for that. We have a lot of children in the subdivision that are on scooters, that are on bikes, that won't know what to do with the four-lane road and stoplights. Children are not prepared for that. And I ask you to consider the safety of our children. I don't know how you can ask half of the subdivision to walk up to the pool. So if we have to get in our cars and drive, that's additional fumes, additional pollution that's not necessary. There has got to be another option for this road, for the campground road extension, other than to cut a subdivision in half. The people that have come before you and the people that came before us, many of the residents inquired about this before they moved in. They, some of them, maybe, I don't know because I wasn't there, but it appears that some of them may have been flat out lied to. Some of them were certainly misrepresented. Oh, it's gonna be a two lane road. Oh, it's not really gonna happen. Oh, it's you know so far in the future, don't even worry about it. Not saying that anybody on the commission did that. It appears that it came from the developer and from the builder. The history is the history. 1996, the road was there. Citizens that inquired didn't get accurate information. The bottom line is we're here today. It's your decision and we have to live with it. And I know it's hard. It's, it's tough to make a decision that affects 309 homes. But my question to you is, are you going to be commissioners that look out for the well-being of your citizens and can step up and not split a subdivision in half? Or is this going to be a commission that is driven more by finances and the revenue that might be created by widening this road and linking it to development that is further down the road? And I leave you with the question that my five-year-old asked me, because this all broke in November, December time frame. And he looked at me and he said, Mommy, how are we going to trick or treat? It's simple everyday things that affect us at a very personal level that I ask you to consider when you're making your final decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> The final person that has signed up for public comment is Deanna Jones of 1925 Breckenridge Plaza in Duluth, Georgia, and she is going to be speaking on fiber optic. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, as you stated, I'm Deanna Jones here, Government Relations Manager here with Charter Communications. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Commission for allowing us the opportunity to speak in regards to the uh, fiber optic resolution. Um, just so you know, um, I have asked prior to the meeting for a copy of the study that was presented by the consultant, but uh, just prior to Christmas, from my understanding, it was not available. So I'm not exactly going to be able to speak to uh, some of the claims or the projections that were made in response to that. Um, but however, um, during this delay that you guys will have, I ask that you guys review a number of the studies easily accessible on the web before making a final decision um, to invest the hard-earned money of Henry County taxpayers into this fiber optic project. Um, as a technology company, we fully understand the excitement that the county um, has as it could potentially spur economic development as it's claimed in the uh, studies that were presented on the October 14th presentation by the consultant. Um, but I want you to bear in mind that public fiber ventures in Georgia and elsewhere in this country have consistently failed to meet 
market projections and fail to repay their bonds and loans time and time again. Uh, project after project have proven to be a detriment to taxpayers. Many of these ventures are forced to sell at a tremendous loss. Uh, the city of Tifton failed to meet projections made by their consultant and just earlier this year sold the network um, to an investor losing $5.8 million of its $10.7 million investment. And we can move a little closer to home. The city of Marietta built 210 miles of fiber to ultimately obtain 180 customers, forcing a sale to a private investor and losing $21 million of its $35 million investment. The city of Ackworth lost 8.5 of its $13.5 million investment. Noonan, Tryon are simply just two more examples of cities in Georgia who have not successfully completed, um, been able to effectively compete in the telecommunications industry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the study has not been uh, made privy to the, to the public as of yet, but I sincerely hope that it addresses some of the issues that have crippled the municipal built fiber optic systems that I've just recently named. Uh, some of those things that have crippled it have been the technolog technological innovations that ultimately outpaced the speed of government's ability to raise the funds needed to upgrade infrastructure and equipment, thereby limiting the county's ability to compete with private investors and potentially rendering the system obsolete in simply a few years. Does the study take into account the cost to procure and secure the bandwidth? What about the growing cost of maintaining that network? In this tight economy, I just ask that the Commission think long and hard about diverting funds to provide duplicate services already furnished by several private investors providers in the county. Please ask the Finance Director and Technology Services Department to find solutions that will benefit the residents of Henry County by connecting or attaching to existing fiber infrastructure thereby minimizing the substantial risk the county is looking to absorb with this proposal. In closing, I ask that the county make the study available to the public uh, immediately to ensure that each of us have the most accurate information. I also extend an opportunity to each commissioner to meet with myself and other service providers in the county to get a full perspective on what the project ultimately will mean to Henry County residents. Unfortunately, the service providers in the county have not been a part of this process and feel that failing to partner or even explore partnering opportunities with these providers who know the ins and outs of this business is a disservice to the taxpaying citizens of Henry County. For the sake of the citizens, please review all the alternative solutions before. Thank you for allowing this um, opportunity and I will entertain any questions. Thank, thank you for your comments. This is uh, simply a public comment session. We do not enter into dialogue or conversation okay. during these comment periods. Thank you. Thank you. And again, that was Charter Communication Representative Deanna Jones. All right, at this time, I would like to announce the upcoming meetings and events. Monday, January 18th, all county offices will be closed in observance of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Tuesday, January 19th at 6.30 p.m., that's a regular board meeting. Monday, February 1st at 9 a.m., a regular workshop meeting. And Tuesday, February 2nd at 9 a.m. will be a regular board meeting. At this time, I need a motion to convene into executive session for the purpose of potential pending litigation, personnel issues, and land acquisition. So Motion by Mr. Stamey. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Basler. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. I need a motion to reconvene into public session. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Stamey, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 4 0. At this time, I need a motion for approval of an affidavit and resolution pertaining to executive session. So moved. Motion by Mr. Bowman. Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? 
motion carries 4-0. If there's no further business to come before this board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, Madam Chair. Have a motion by Mr. Basler. Is there a second? <laughs> second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. <laughs>